indie heartthrob Sam Fender quickly retracted an Instagram post he made a few days ago, branding Johnny Depp a serious hero in a selfie he took with the actor alongside guitarist Jeff Beck somewhere up in Newcastle. Sam Fender wrote one of my all-time favourite songs, I. It's a blame game, it's a fame trap, it's the martyrdom of the spoken, it's the last breath of the awoken, and the woke kids are just dickheads, and the dickheads are all ages. I don't have time for the very few, they never have time for me and you. I don't have time for the very few. They never have time for me and you. What I like about Sam Fender is that he is honest, especially about human beings being inherently flawed and fuck-ups. I completely agree, and I love his music for this reason alone. And so I will take this Instagram post as I take everything I see online, fascinating social artifacts to explore and analyze. Of course, Sam Fender was saying that he admires Johnny and Beck insofar as they are musical idols, but the timing was pretty specific. And if you haven't listened to Sam Fender, please do. His music throbs. But this isn't about Sam Fender, but the context surrounding his Instagram post, namely the recent verdict of the Depp vs. Heard defamation trial. Finally, it has come to an end. It has come to an end and we can get back to our lives and, hopefully, restore relationships ruined by two multi-millionaires who decided to bring the intricacies of their tumultuous relationship to our screens and feeds. Firstly, I'd like to say that I completely respect the verdict that was reached. And I must say, I was not expecting this outcome, considering that many a legal expert beyond the domain of social media thought a Johnny Depp victory tricky to achieve in the US legal system. And when I refer to legal experts, I'm specifically talking about those beyond YouTube, whom, like the rest of us, want clicks before everything else. I hadn't expected Johnny to win every single count, which he didn't. Amber Heard was awarded $2 million, Johnny Depp was awarded $15 million, of which he will likely only see $8.35 million due to Virginian law placing a cap on punitive damages claims. Heard was awarded after the jury determined that she had also been defamed when Johnny's lawyer had told the Daily Mail in 2020 that Amber's abuse allegations were, and I quote, a hoax. Going on the history of defamation cases in the US and the UK, it is a lot easier to win a defamation case in the UK, considering that the right and the freedom of speech is not protected under constitutional dictates. We in the UK do not have a codified constitution. And so, I'll admit, it was quite unprecedented to see this outcome, considering that Amber Heard had not even named Johnny Depp as her abuser in the piece which started this entire defamation trial. I'd also like to say that I am a big Johnny Depp fan, particularly of his independent films, and on a selfish level, I am thrilled that he likely will have to resort more and more to independent film projects as opposed to blockbuster Hollywood films due to the undeniable sullying of his reputation. I think in the short term, Hollywood is going to be all over him. But Hollywood is also very liberal and still very much committed to its hashtag MeToo campaign. So I doubt that once Johnny becomes old news, as is the nature of these sorts of things, Hollywood will alter its ways. Independent films add more value to the arts than franchises and blockbusters, in my humble humble opinion. 90s Johnny Depp would be a hell of a treat for us artsy independent film goers. Ah, give me a what's eating Gilbert Grape any day. Based on the internet and social media, America is pretty much on the side of Johnny Depp in perceiving him as a victim of domestic abuse. Similarly, numerous polls have drawn the same conclusion, that Americans have been far more interested in following and understanding and being vocal participants in this case, relative to showing the same amount of interest in other global events and also in rather harrowing and heartbreaking national 
international events. As such, the world has to follow suit. But when comparing the media coverage of this case, it is interesting to draw comparisons between US media and US social media relative to media and social media in the United Kingdom. And with that aside, let's consider the UK legal system and its depiction and namely its verdict on Johnny Depp. Within the UK legal system, Johnny Depp is considered no hero nor a victim. He has been nationally branded a quote wife beater since ex-wife Amber Heard published her notorious op-ed in the Washington Post detailing her history of domestic abuse. Importantly, she never named Johnny Depp by name. Following this, news outlets in the UK began openly speculating, putting two and two together before labeling Johnny Depp a quote unquote wife beater. Johnny subsequently took news group newspapers, Limited, and then executive editor of The Sun, Dan Wooten, to court for LaBelle in July 2020. In their defense, NGN, alongside Don Wooten, who had in fact authored The Sun article titled Gone Potty, How Can JK Rowling Be Genuinely Happy Casting Wife Beater Johnny Depp in the New Fantastic Beast film, cited 14 instances of domestic violence committed by Johnny against Heard. Amber was called to give evidence on behalf of NGN and Wooten. And this is ultimately where things get a little complicated. The UK High Court of Justice determined that Wooten's peace in the sun had not in fact been libellous. The great majority of alleged assaults of Miss Heard by Mr. Depp have been proved to the civil standard. Amber's evidence was concluded to have been substantively true and 12 of the 14 instances determined to also be true, officially proved to a civil standard. Johnny Depp was also unsuccessful in getting the verdict appealed. And now let's fast forward to the present. In the US, the public opinion most definitely played a role in the final verdict. And by public opinion, I don't mean social media. I mean the public opinion insofar as a jury's verdict and final decision was concerned. I mean the jury insofar as it is composed of members of the public. In the UK, however, UK High Court Justice Andrew Nicholl determined quite a different verdict, and this verdict still stands. And notably, this verdict was reached without a jury decision or presence. I noted in my previous video on this that it was no neutral decision of Johnny Depp and his legal team to have this defamation trial take place in the state of Virginia. And this was a fantastic strategic move insofar as ensuring that public opinion would most definitely play a role in Johnny's favor. And I'd say that this could particularly be seen by the mixed response to Johnny's defamation trial and unsuccessful appeal back in 2020. Not only had that trial tarnished the image of Johnny Depp, but also of Amber Heard. In the state of Virginia, a court may, solely in its discretion, permit cameras in judicial proceedings, insofar as upholding the rights of the general public to have direct access to its legal system. Mark Stevens, an international media lawyer, said the fact that the US case was heard before a jury, while the UK trial was heard before a judge, was significant. Because the US trial was before a jury, it allowed Depp's lawyers to focus on Heard, a well-worn tactic of defendants in domestic abuse cases, but one that was dismissed by the judge in the UK, Stevens said. They deny that they, their client, did anything. They deny they're the real perpetrator, and they attack the credibility of the individual calling out the abuse, and then reverse the roles of the victim and the offender. What is worth noting is that jurors in this defamation case were not sequestered. That is, they were not isolated or kept hidden from the public at large. They were instructed not to read about the trial online yet their phones were not taken away from them. In the UK, Amber was determined to be a credible witness. In the US, she clearly was not. And evidence brought forward by Depp's expert LaBelle legal team placed considerable emphasis on Amber being a less than credible witness. And it is important to note these different strategies taken by Depp's legal team in July of 2020 relative to their far more pressing and highly effective strategy taken in the last six weeks. 
And what were some of these new strategies? Well, there were many. He got himself a new legal team. They definitely came far more prepared and ready for action. It is definitely notable to me that Amber and her legal team were not prepared for the influence of public opinion to be so all-encompassing and so strong. But one strategy which researchers and experts alike have been fascinated by, not necessarily in so far as reaching a consensual conclusion on how it was used and deployed by which party in this trial, was the Davo tactics. And this has been an interesting one for researchers and academics beyond the social media sphere. What is noteworthy is that the more high profile and social media presence legal professionals have, the substantially more likely they were to be on Johnny Depp's side of the fence. Take from that what you will. I just thought I would put it out there. DAVO stands for Deny, Attack and Reverse Victim and Offender. In trying to deny accountability for their actions, a perpetrator of violence or abuse will resort to such tactics. And this is particularly seen in cases of sexual or domestic violence when brought to trial. In the case of Depp and Heard, the fact that both made damning accusations of violence and assault against one another has made it nigh impossible for analysts, psychologists and social scientists, let alone us laypersons, to make a sound judgment on how such tactics may or may not have been deployed during the trial. And this is very important to consider because we live in an online age in which the victim mentality reigns. And this is perfectly understandable. We are living through very precarious times in which being heard or acquiring the thing which we as humans desire more than anything, that is attention, is becoming more and more difficult to acquire. And in this world, we try to make things as understandable as possible. And by doing that, it means that we have to unfortunately ignore the complex nature of reality and how in reality oftentimes there is not in fact that clear victim abuser dichotomy. The fostering of a clear victim abuser dichotomy was excellently done by Johnny Depp's legal team. The National Coalition Against Domestic Violence, a resource which provides information for determining the central aggressor of violence in a relationship, has determined that it is, and I quote, difficult to determine who is the core aggressor, especially when both people in a relationship use violence. That is, contrary to the widespread image and belief that domestic abuse is a binary, it isn't necessarily as clear as all that. The National Coalition Against Domestic Violence tries, for legal purposes, as best it can to establish who in a relationship is the core aggressor and who is the primary victim. What is important in this distinction is core and primary. Because these two qualifiers importantly diminish the dichotomy, they diminish the binary, demonstrating realistically, and as is correct, that life is far more complicated than we give it credit for. As far as both defamation trials went, both Depp and Heard were determined by the respective courts to have been abusive during their marriage, physically, emotionally, and verbally. Neither has truly taken accountability for their actions because, in all order to win a case, it is important to make things seem as concise and straightforward as possible. The greys and blurs of real life will get nowhere, and clearly, for both parties, time was money. The victim mentality of both was such that neither proved willing to take responsibility for the state of their marriage, nor a willingness to see both as mutually fostering what was clearly an undesirable situation, and their diminishing careers as a consequence. But I'd like to, of all things, make a reference to a Twitter thread which I happened upon. It was written by sociologist Nicole Badira of the University of Michigan. If you're following the Depp trial, you have probably seen a lot of women saying some version of, I'm a survivor, and as a real survivor, I can tell you that you shouldn't believe Amber Heard. Why is this happening? First, it's worth noting that survivors are a heterogeneous group. Perpetrators do not pick victims based on their political beliefs, and experiences
experiencing violence is not always a radicalizing event for women. I conducted my dissertation work in a conservative state and there were a lot of conservative victims who insisted that I should believe them but not other women. One even emailed me a Jordan Peterson video to try to convince me to write a victim blaming dissertation. These women are particularly likely to express anger at other women who speak out because they are ruining my credibility. Survivors who hold these ideologies are particularly likely to be elevated by groups like men's rights activists. They see sexist women as legitimizing their movement as not about gender and not about hate. There's a reason so many of the men's rights activist groups who focus on college sexual violence, for example, are at least symbolically headed by women. And there are women happy to take on that role, especially if it confers them some privileges and protections in the usually white heteropatriarchy. There are a lot of gendered tropes of acceptable, again white, femininity that center on empathizing with men, like the cool girl trope, or the idea that a good mother will defend her son from the consequences of a rape allegation, even if she believes he is guilty. That type of femininity is very much on display right now, and the women who engage in it do get tangible results, even if they don't get equality, such as being the one victim a misogynist believes was rarely raped. There's another problem at play too. Survivors are experts in their experience but not necessarily all experiences of gender-based violence. And some will begin to rank other survivors' stories based on how similar they are to their own. The tactics perpetrators use to perpetrate are varied and often reflect the privileges they and their victims hold. But survivors who hold dominant identities, for example, whiteness, heterosexuality, can be quick to try to see their own privileged experiences as universal. It's one of the reasons the benefits of the hashtag MeToo to movement haven't necessarily extended to women of color or poverty or working class women. The media version of the movement rarely centered white wealthy women's experiences. Of course, not all women speaking out against Amber Heard fit into either of these categories. There's another big reason that women try to distance themselves from high profile survivors, and it's based on something scholars call the just world theory. The simple version of the just world theory is that good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people, that the world is fundamentally just, and women watching high-profile trials are invested in believing that to be true. It can be scary, and for victims, re-traumatizing, for women to empathize with an abuse survivor. If violence really is everywhere, and if it feels like it can happen to anyone, then a lot of women will start to worry that they will be next. And that is too much for a lot of women to handle, especially over the course of a long trial. To avoid the psychological toll, women will refocus their empathy on a perpetrator because it is easier to stomach. Women invested in just world theory are also particularly likely to victim blame. By pointing out what a victim could or should have done differently, they can convince themselves that they would never experience that kind of violence. It's one of the reasons that women juries are particularly likely to acquit in gender-based violence cases. It's counterintuitive, but it can feel like an act of self-preservation in the moment. So is it surprising that a lot of women are coming to Depp's defense. No, not at all. It is completely consistent with the academic literature on how many women respond to disclosures of sexual violence, especially when they have some relationship to a perpetrator. And this post intrigued me. I do, like everyone, have my own internal biases, but mainly because it really shed light on how the court of public opinion, specifically on social media, is very ill-equipped to pass judgment, dogmatic judgment, on an issue as complex as this. What this trial has really brought home for me is how we really oftentimes take for granted the assumption that American culture is global culture. I find this quite fascinating considering that millennials and Gen Z are incredibly vocal about neocolonialism and neo-imperialism but are quite oblivious to the fact that it is almost assumed that the rest of the world sees the world from an American social media lens. And you know what? This is actually 
quite understandable and is not necessarily me wagging my finger at anyone. The history of the internet and social media is very much based in the American context. Based on the internet alone, it is very easy to assume that Johnny Depp had evidence up his sleeve like nobody preceding him, that he was and is a fully fledged victim of domestic violence whose voice is finally being heard, no pun intended. I consider this to be a general issue with the internet, considering that it is so Americanized in and of itself. And I notice this conflation of US global culture in many a sphere, for instance, in the domain of race relations. I think a great deal has been missed regarding both of these trials, that is the defamation trial of July 2020 to November and this one just passed. Neither one of these trials was a domestic violence case. Both trials were explicitly defamation trials and as such they were intent on establishing whether statements made by a particular party were false and or subsequently led to undermining and damaging their good reputation. Defamation is generally considered a tortious act, that is a civil wrong that causes some sort of harm or damage to a claimant. Both of these trials were first and foremost about Johnny Depp regaining his reputation as an A-list celebrity and Hollywood actor. What I have also learned is that if you throw enough money at the law, the law will reward you. It may take two years, but eventually it will. In fact, it is virtually impossible for anybody to know the truth of what actually happened in that absolute shamble of a marriage. Voice recordings are just that. Voices taken entirely out of context, void of the time and space, the emotion, and the important external factors which bring everything together. This trial was about reputation and the well-known fact that money can do wonders for one's reputation. And what it has also shown me is that, in fact, once we get over this current wave of interest and intrigue and moral and societal soul searching in the way that we seem to think we are apparently doing, things won't change. Irrespective of whose side I am on, I am, in all honesty, not on anyone's side in this. I think that these are both just two celebrities who care about their image and their brand more than anything else. And because of that, and actually just because I want to, I am still going to watch Johnny Depp films. I'm still going to watch Aquaman and Aquaman 2. And that is because Johnny Depp, like his ex wife is a commercial product. He is a public figure, an artist. On this channel I like hard truths and here is another one. Johnny Depp is not our friend. He is not a nice guy or a bad guy or whatever you want to brand him. We don't and realistically never will know him and therefore realistically we cannot make these kinds of assertions of his character and personhood in the way that we tend to be doing now on social media feeds. He is a phenomenal actor and his public image and persona is incredibly enchanting. That makes a lot more sense to deduce from his public appearances as an actor as well as in a public court. Jack Sparrow is a hero, a character with marketable value, but Johnny Depp, the man, most definitely is not. The rhetoric around Johnny Depp reminds me significantly of the same kind of rhetoric South Africans had around Nelson Mandela, our first democratically elected president. The issue was that in making Nelson Mandela a hero, inevitably he was set up for disappointment because it failed to appreciate that he was a man. Heroes always fail to live up to fantastical expectations of those who brand them as such. In the case of Johnny 
step, the expectations are somewhere along the lines of the legal process becoming fairer for men and women, male victims of domestic violence being able to come forward and being believed, the hashtag MeToo movement becoming purer and far less one-sided. And these are all admirable beliefs and pursuits, but they are just that. Pursuits that we as a world and global community are a long way from even laying a finger tip on and beliefs that have nothing substantively to do with the reality which the vast majority of the global population lives and experiences. This trial has most definitely brought into the public psyche, mine included, that men can be and oftentimes are victims of domestic abuse and violence. And this is an important conversation to be having, no doubt. It has, however, failed to appreciate that the likelihood of men and women who come forward actually being able to get justice or compensation for their ordeals is largely determined by how much money they have in the bank, how much money they are willing and able to spend, and how large a social media following they are able to garner before going to trial, which can be used by a PR team to sway the public opinion on their side. The vast majority of victims men and women will not receive justice. The law won't be on their side and neither will truth. The law, regrettably, as we see it today in modern societies, is not on the side of truth. It is on the side of that which feeds it, which is money. And that is all. What never was, can never perish. Thank you so much for watching this video. I will be keeping the comment section open, so please leave your thoughts below. I personally will not be engaging in this comment section because I will be holding a live stream discussion based on this very topic. And so feel free to pop in or to watch the live stream after it has been streamed in order to see my thoughts and opinions and to engage with me directly. Please be mindful and respectful in the comments as well as in the live stream if you're present. I'd love to have you there and I will see you very soon in the next one.